people that have come across the story, um, through 1989, when I was a television presenter with the BBC and also a national spokesman for the British Green Party, I started having this very strange experience that kept on recurring. When I was in a room alone, it felt like there was a presence there. And this got more and more powerful until the spring of 1990 in a hotel in London called the Kensington Hilton working for the BBC. It was this, this, this presence in the room was so tangible that I sat on the side of the bed and I looked into the room and I said, look, if, the, if there's something there, would you please contact me because you're driving me up the wall. Then I was with my young son, he was at the time, he's a strapping 30 year old now, and someone stopped me to talk about football. I saw that Gareth, you know, my son wasn't there. But I knew where he was, he was in the shop looking at books. So I walked in, uh, as I did so, my feet wouldn't move. This was the first real confirmation to me that something real strange was going on. So, uh, around March 1990, there was a very strong thought form that went through my mind that was almost of voice proportions. And it, says, it said, go and look at the books on the far side. And I thought, why do I want to go over the books? First of all, it's like, what's going on? But also, why do I want to go and look at romantic novels? Of course, you know, you're, you're, you're bewildered, but you're also intrigued. And I started to walk towards the books and my, you know, my feet could move then. And then there was one which caught my eye because it was so different right in the middle. And it was a book called Mind to Mind by a, a professional psychic called uh, Betty Shine. And, uh, but, and uh, all I saw was the face. And I turned it over. And I read the, the blurb at the back and I saw the word psychic. And what really struck me was, would this lady pick up what I'm feeling around me, this presence? Four hours, I contacted her and um, she invited me over. And I went a couple of times and, and what I said to her was not, look, I'm having these strange experiences. I, you know, I don't want to lead people on like that. I want to see what comes naturally. Um, I just said, quite truthfully, I've got rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, look at it. But, um, and and, and I, nothing's helped. I don't take drugs. I wouldn't take drugs for it. I, I wouldn't be here now if I had, given I've had it since I was 15. Um, and maybe your hands-on healing, which she also did, would help. And I got the hands-on healing a couple of times. Um, and we had a nice chat about other dimensions of reality. It all made sense to me. And the third time I went, and she's sit, uh, sitting next to my left knee like that, you know, doing the old hands-on. And I felt like a a spider's web on my face, like a cobweb, very, very uh, obviously, because I'd just read in her book, you know, a matter of uh, you know, two weeks, three weeks earlier, that uh, when other dimensions of reality, whatever you want to call it, are trying to lock into you, you sometimes feel a spider's web on your face. Now, all these years later, I know exactly what that feeling was. It was electromagnetic energy, frequency ranges of reality, an information field, an energetic vibrational information. Um, an English psychic would, would tune into that projection and they would decode it into English. A Spanish psychic would connect into the same information field and communicate it in Spanish. Wow. I didn't say anything to her about this, this feeling, uh, the spider's web now. And then about 10 or 15 seconds after I felt that, she goes, oh my God, I've got to close my eyes for this one. This is powerful. And I'm like, mm, what's going on here? It's all new to me. She was telling me what these figures were asking her to tell me. And it was that I was going to go out on a world stage eventually and reveal great secrets, that I was going to write a series of books, um, that there was a, 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 an energetic transformation coming, which I dubbed the truth vibrations at the time, because what, what I was told was this energetic vibrational change, which I now would describe as an information change, in the information fabric of this universe was going to act like a spiritual alarm clock. It was going to wake people up from what they were in, which was a, a basically a hypnotic state, a coma state, living a fake reality, as I would say today. In 1990, there was absolutely no sign or evidence whatsoever that there was going to be some colossal human awakening. But when you look at it now, there is a global awakening happening. It's not the vast majority yet. It's not the majority yet. 
But at different levels, people are awakening and they're looking at the world and themselves and reality in an increasingly different way, more expanded way. And events in the world um, are in, in many ways triggering this because people are looking at this mayhem that's going on and going, what's happening? What's happening? They're looking for answers. Um, and then you, 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 you look at what we know now about how the world is controlled by a network, a cabal of families that control the banking system, the political system, the transnational corporations, the oil cartel, the pharmaceutical cartel, the biotech cartel, the global media, and mainstream media, etc. You look at what we know now about how that works and what its, what its game is and what its methods of manipulation are, then what I was told on that March day in 1980 about this transformation of human society and the effect of this vibrational information change is demonstrably happening and, 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 and has been happening for a while now and it's getting more and more powerful. The people who are now beginning to go, hold on a second, I'm looking at myself and the world in a different way suddenly, you know, are people who just a little while ago you'd say never them never them they will never break out of the box in their lifetime because they seem to be so uh, enslaved by it and now even some of those uh, uh, people who were absolutely system program people uh, are now beginning to, to see it there wasn't this battle between David Icke television presenter Green Party spokesman um, and this, this experience. And so it felt so right to me, I just went with it. One of the messages that came through that time was one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that can change the world. And this is a vital fact. This is not about me. It's about the information. That's what is, that's the transforming thing. Every now and again, you might have a little thought, you know, I wonder, wonder what this force is. Because it was blatant from, the, from, from then on that the communication said through her that they were going to put information into my mind and, and at other times they were going to lead me to knowledge. There was no need for arduous seeking. All I had to do was follow the clues they would give me. It's been like some hidden force handing me pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, um, virtually in the order necessary for me to see where they go. And, and if that had not been happening all this time, I'd been left to get on with it. I might still be on book two, and it would be nothing nearly uh, as uh, expansive as what it is. There is a force. It's taken me into realms of enormous ridicule and enormous abuse. But we come back to the greatest gift uh, often that you are ever given is your worst nightmare, or what appears to be. So if we go back to the Wogan show, because what happened eventually is I went on the Wogan show and talked about what was happening to me. And at that time, I was right in that period of the Wogan show, it was a period of about three months. I was going through an enormous transformation because this is what happened just very 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 briefly I suddenly got this feeling I, I needed to go to Peru I didn't know why I'd never been there I, I watched them play in the World Cup uh, a few times but I didn't know anything about it and a, a series of enormously amazing things happened to me and it culminated at a place called Siustani, which is near a place called Puno, near Lake Titicaca, highest navigable lake in the world, they say, about 13,000 feet. Yeah. At this so-called Inca site um, called Siustani, which is all Inca ruins on a hill, and there's a, a lake and mountains right out in the middle of nowhere. And I, I went and I, I looked around it. I'd, I'd hired this taxi and this uh, guide came with me and, and we're driving away from see you starting daydreaming out the window sort of mind wandering and I'm looking at this hill as we're coming towards it and as I looked at this hill all I could hear in my head was come to me come to me come to me you know and I'm thinking you know I, I was introducing I was introducing the snooker uh, not long ago actually 
And now this freaking hell's talking to me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's what's going on? <laughs> and so I, t- I asked the guy to stop. I said, I won't be a minute, I'm going up that hill. And I walked up the hill. And I didn't know where I was going or why. And um, there's, there's this, all these kind of stones. It's kind of a kind of circle-like of stones. And I, I walked into the middle, and it's beautiful. And there's not a cloud in the sky. It's a, a pure blue Peruvian sky, piercing sun, red nose to prove it. And I stood there, and what happened to me then happened to me. I cover this bit in the new shop in Ride, where I'm standing there, and suddenly I feel like my feet are being pulled to the ground and like it like magnetically and i'm feeling like a drill in the top of my head and the atmosphere changed again only this was much more powerful than the news show and i heard this again very strong thought form go through my mind which said um first of all they'll be talking about this a hundred years from now what and then which seemed absolutely crazy given the sky and the sun and the, it will be over when you feel the rain, right? And then what happened is um, my arms went out like that without me making any decision to, 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 to do that. And then this energy got more and more powerful. And in the end, my body's shaking. And, and what, um, was happening it's like when you're driving a car and you can't remember the last mile your subconscious has been driving the car thank goodness um, I, I kept coming back to some kind of consciousness and then going it, it, back somewhere else and as I came back to consciousness at one point my conscious mind I noticed that over the far distant mountains there was a light grey mist and I'm watching it and it's getting darker and it's getting darker faster and I think It's freaking raining. And then over, not very long, the whole thing took maybe, I don't know, an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. This storm came out of the, I mean, you couldn't make it up. If you you put put this on a a movie, they'd say, oh, come on, it happened. This this storm is coming towards me. And you know, weather people talk about a, a front. Yeah. Well, this is a front. It's a straight bloody line. I'm looking up. It's, it's, it's literally out of some crazy movie. And this, and it's stair rod rain. It's not just raining, it's stair rod rain. And it's coming towards me. And I'm standing there and, and I'm seeing this wall of water coming towards me. It's like something out of bloody Moses. <laughs> Freaking <laughs> Red Sea. And, 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 he, he, and by this time, I'm, my body's shaking like crazy with this energy coming through me. And then the water hit me. I mean, I'm immediately drenched because it's stair rod rain. And bang, the energy stopped. And I staggered forward like Bambi, because my legs were gone. And uh, there was en- energy pouring out my feet and pouring out my hands. And it's still pouring out of uh, my feet. I couldn't sleep that night uh, because of it. Um, and something changed. Um, I, 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 you, you, if you, people could imagine, you lived your life in a bubble um, literally a bubble of information, a bubble of perception. And someone's come along without any warning and popped the bloody thing. And suddenly everything that was outside the bubble was pouring in. So my mind is absolutely awash with information, concepts, insights. What the hell's going on? That, you know, it was just a, a chaotic mass of, of, of information and thought and everything. And in that period, it lasted about three months. If you'd have asked me my name, I'd have checked. And that it was in that period, in my turquoise shell suit, that I went on to um, the um, the Wogan show, and and everything that 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 happened. Um, and after about three months, after all the ridicule and all the newspapers and all that stuff. You, you know when you, you, you press too many keys on a computer and the computer freezes? Mm-hmm. says, I can't process this. Well, that was me. There was so much information pouring into my uh, uh, conscious mind as a result of that experience in Peru. I, I couldn't process it. I mean, I, you basically froze. What happened after three months is it unfroze. And now 
I'm, I'm the old David again, but I ain't. I'm seeing the world in a completely different way. I, I was seeing things and connections that I um, couldn't see before. Did you ever question yourself there, David, and think, am I losing my mind? Do I need to go and get help? Or did you just feel right for you? Did, it, well, did you understand that a bit more? Well, it felt right to me. I'm say I completely understood it then. Um, it felt right to me. And, and I, 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 did, I did what I always do, like I've just mentioned earlier. I thought, okay, I'm going with this and we're going to see where it's going to go. Um, and I didn't know where it was going, but I'm going to go with this and see where it goes. Um, and people were coming up to me after that, you know, shh, unfreezing. And they were saying, I thought, they thought you'd gone mad, you're the same Dave we used to know, but I wasn't. I, I appeared to be, but I wasn't. I was seeing the world in a completely different way. And of course, in, in a world which is overwhelmingly programmed to see the world in a certain way, it's what happens through the education system and the media and peer pressure, it's a very, very narrow band of sense of the possible, sense of what is. When you start talking about things that are different to that, then immediately the reaction is you're crazy or you're dangerous, or in my case, um, you're both. But <laughs> what followed, what followed, of course, was mass ridicule as a result the Wogan show. And people said, you know, it must have been horrible. Well, it was, but it was the greatest gift I ever have been given because it set me free of the prison that most people live in, which is the fear of what other people think. You either go under and you disappear or you come out like steel honed in the fire. When I first heard David Icke relating his experience, I was confused. It should have been validating, but to hear someone else speaking about my experience dumbfounded me. So let me tell you my story. There are differences, but there are strong similarities, and the end result is indistinguishable. Throughout my life, I have experienced unexplained phenomena, for want of a better word. I'm sure in shamanic cultures, my experience would be ex considered normal and consistent with their version of reality. However, in this Western system, where thinking is co considerably narrowed by our system of newspeak and doublethink, only acceptable views are entertained, which is sad because it narrows life experience to a very thin band of reality. But that's another video entirely. Around the age of 25, after traveling various parts of the world for two years, I returned to Australia and landed a job I should never have walked into. And it was thanks to an enlightened soul I met on the beach in Turkey. My whole journey was quite literally an out of this world experience, but it opened my mind to alien highways of thought that I had never considered and I'd never thought possible. When I returned, the world sparkled I sparkled and people, total strangers, reacted to me with strange open warmth. Friends I was with noticed the unusual treatment. I felt different. I told my best friend I wished I could bottle the feeling and give it not only to her but to everyone. So marked was this change. I also knew that the old state of mind, the mundane outlook, would return all too soon, so each magical day I treasured. It took some months for the feeling to diminish, but in many ways it never left. A few years later I travelled again, for another 18 months or so. On returning that time I got a job, bought a house and found a car, all through strange coincidences and alignments that should never have occurred. To this day, one of them nobody has been able to explain but that's also another story i bought my house when i had popped out for groceries but on a whim headed to an, an area unfamiliar to me with my intuition telling me to go there i left the shopping trolley in the middle of the aisle and just walked out of the store returning home threw the papers on the island bench in the kitchen and proclaimed to my housemate Hey, I just bought a house and I need $15,000 in 30 days. I'm not sure how, but I managed it. 
Having just returned from travelling, I had a dry bank account, but fortunately I landed a new job that play, paid well, and with the ability to live on nothing that I'd learned in various places like Thailand, I was committed. That was the least of the problems surrounding the impulse buy, but nonetheless, it all came together. Many other strange things continued. Both myself and my boyfriend landed jobs on mine sites, different mine sites. Through our fly-in and fly-out roster, we neatly corresponded. He flew up in the morning, I flew that same night. On one of the regular trips to the airport, we navigated the exit and pulled up to the traffic lights on top of a hill. The intersection crossed dual carriageways with the central traffic island. The sharp incline of the exit ramp made it impossible to see oncoming traffic entering the intersection across the bridge to the right. My boyfriend was driving and there was virtually no traffic on the roads. It was 4.30am and as the lights changed to green, he lifted his foot off the clutch to propel the car through the intersection I yelled stop and my hand flew across his chest as he was about to lurch the car forward surprised he seized his actions immediately and turned to me and uttered what and before he could even complete the word what a speeding car blurred across our path sliding across three lanes in front of us just missed the traffic light in set in the middle of the roads and the car bounced off the cement curves of the divider across both lanes on the other side of the dual carriageway and disappeared down the incline on the far side of the highway there was no doubt that had I not followed my instinct to stop my boyfriend, he and most probably myself would have been dead before the moment we found ourselves in. Fuck, that was close, my boyfriend sighed. And he said, how did you know? And I said, I just knew I had to stop you. And we both stared across the other side of the road and the car had completely disappeared. And then we saw it driving off down the other side so it had gone across the lawn and off it went in the other direction but it was going so fast it just couldn't stop so a couple of weeks after this I was watching cricket on television both myself and my boyfriend were on break and at home and my boyfriend walked into the room and asked what I was watching I looked at him strangely and rep replied I'm watching the cricket and kind of gestured to the television like can't you see and he looked at the screen and said but that's not cricket and I couldn't understand what he was talking about. I was watching, I was watching the cricket. And I even saw the ads during the ad breaks and everything. I asked him what he meant. And he said, well, the television isn't even on. And I said, yes, it is. What are you talking about? And he said, no, the television isn't on. And I said, well, yes, it is. And I gave him a ball by ball description of play, exactly what I was seeing. And he kind of turns to me and he shrugs and he walks out and he says, no, that television is not on. And yet I was watching the cricket. And I've now come to believe that somehow I was on a higher frequency. And I think because the TV was on standby rather than turned off at the PowerPoint, my mind was tuned into the frequency and I was watching, I mean, I was watching the game and he went and checked the score on a different source. Um, to find out what the live score was and I yelled to him well this is a score and he goes well yeah that's what it says the score is and when they got a wicket like when somebody got out that's what I was seeing on the television so he said that the television was off but I was watching the cricket on the television that it, explain that you can't explain that beyond that I was operating on some kind of higher frequency and being an activist um, by birth I've always followed world events from a global perspective and I was given a warning about the attacks on September the um, September the 11th 2001 and for no reason at all I woke up in the middle of the night screaming I actually thought it was an Israeli attack on the Palestinian occupied territories because it was just after um, some demonstrations over there and people were getting evicted, similar to the Rachel Corrie incident in 2003, but this was earlier, an Israeli attack on Palestine. But 
there were people running everywhere and they were running from the big dust clouds and they had the um, holding handkerchiefs and their shirts over their faces so they could breathe and they were running um, down roads away from this huge dust cloud behind them and everything was grey and everything was colour covered with this dust and I woke up screaming and I had this calming effect on me it has to happen it has to happen and I couldn't understand quite what that feeling meant but it did reassure me and I did kind of understand that whatever it was had to happen even though that that didn't make any sense to me it was still calming because of the way that I was getting this message whatever you want to call it through and I warned my friends that something was going to happen and um, to, so to be ready with it and within a couple of weeks it happened and quite a number of them rang me and said what should I do or what should we do and they realised that the event that I had described to them um, was beaming into their living rooms at that moment so they contacted me to ask. This set of events culminated after I settled, in, settled into my new home. Reading something on the internet a declassified document I realized the enormity of what I was reading and I couldn't take it I couldn't believe the craziness that was in our world and I ran out of the room tears streaming down my face to the sliding glass door that led out onto the veranda intending to scream across the valley as I pulled the door open and stepped across the threshold I froze I couldn't move forward or backward I could only slide the door open with both arms spread one on the door frame and one on the sliding door, one foot in the house and one foot on the wooden planks out on the veranda, I just froze. I couldn't tell you what was around me. I was swept into a reality beyond the five senses of my conscious state. My mind opened and a huge download torrent of information channeled into my awareness. I f it was a flood of insight and knowing and ideas and comprehension of subjects that I had never contemplated, sought out or understood. In answer to the question I had been asking about those who could do the things I had been reading about, this voice, which wasn't really a voice per se, but rather an implanted idea that didn't come from me, because it was outside my perspective, but it consoled me by saying they know not what they do and this idea of Jesus Christ on the cross came to me and that was to help me grasp the concept of the message that they know not what they do and I repeated it out loud they know not what they do and my whole being felt this peace and serenity just washed over me and I felt secure and comforted in a way that I'd never experienced. It was what I had linked to something beyond usual sensing and while this was happening the information kept flooding my mind and as it downloaded I understood that my reality had not even been close to whatever this was. That I'd, I'd never been spiritual. I'd always stated vehemently and categorically that I was agnostic but if it was proved to me that something existed beyond the material world I would believe in some higher power but until it was proven to my satisfaction it would remain undetermined or an open case pending evidentiary value but after I received this information my re my reality changed it took months to process being an analyst with an inquiring mind I sat down and I wrote everything out I wanted to record what had happened why it told me it happened and how it had occurred and when I had finished I pretty much had a handbook I didn't seek answers before writing it out because I didn't want ideas outside myself contaminating my own personal impressions and thoughts of my own experience. So after I wrote it all down and had my template for the experience, I could only think of one thing. And I thought if this has happened to me, it has to have happened to others. 
I'm not arrogant enough to believe that it could only be me who had reached this conduit of insight. And when I turned to the mystic philosophies and ancient wisdom, and even reading some of the Bible, it dawned on me that they were all talking about this experience. It also dawned on me why they were all slightly different. Because trying to explain this to anyone who had not had the experience themselves, it's near impossible. It's, it's actually impossible because unless you've had the experience, you cannot explain it to somebody. Yes, they can say, oh, um, yeah, wow, and all this kind of stuff. But they, it, you have to have the feeling with it. You have, to, you have to know what this feels like because it's incredible. I mean, it is, un, it, no words no words and this is why parables and metaphors and similes are the only way that you can explain it like this or it's like this or imagine this and and so it's the only way to explain it and that's probably why the bible is full of metaphors and parables so when david ike says he was muddling his way through it and appearing on television interview while while he was muddling his way through it, I can only begin to imagine what I might have said before my hypothesis and explanation had been nutted out. And as David says, then the knowledge finds you. And many times, like David, I've said it's like a jigsaw puzzle and pieces appear ready to be slotted into place. A better analogy for me is Ariadne's web, which is followed into the labyrinth and then you use the breadcrumb pieces to find your way out so you f go into the labyrinth to realize there's a labyrinth to realize there's a matrix and then you have to use Ariadne's thread the pieces of the puzzle to get out and to figure out the whole of Ariadne's way not just how you got in there but also how you get out and what it all means the ancients and many indigenous cultures and Eastern philosophies and of course early Christians and Gnostics knew of this connection because they describe it perfectly and when I read their works I identify with it straight away now. Before my experience I would have looked at it and I wouldn't have had a clue what they were talking about but now I can see because I've had the experience I can see what they're talking about clearly and I was also led to books like David mentioned he was I was led to a whole library and <laughs> strangely enough it was called Alexandria's Library because I met a woman in a shopping center just a random meeting which was obviously not random because it was predestined in some way and I struck up a conversation with her about all things cat food and by the 10 minutes or 15 minutes of, of standing there talking to her she asked me if I was having any experiences and this was just after I'd completed my inverted commas thesis and written it all down and I said well funnily enough you say that yes she said well I've got a whole library for you now I don't know how she how she knew but she she knew I didn't mention it to her first and her name turned out to be Alex Alexandra but everyone called her Alex I went straight from that shop, paid for my shopping and, and followed her to her house and she had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on this subject and I started looking through the books and she became my conduit to confirm my experience and bring it into the physical realm because she had the books that were explaining to me what I had explained to her and it was it was just serendipitous and it was supposed to be for a long time the final picture was mysterious and there simply weren't enough pieces now most of it's clear but there's one corner that remains completely veiled and there's just not enough pieces to fill that corner in and that's to do with the realm i know certain things about it but then there's other things that i don't know and um i'm not sure i'm supposed to know them anyway or perhaps that's what's left to come but my experience is very similar to the way David describes his. So I think he had a real experience because I know I did.